Welcome back in to Revealing the Truth. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and you're watching on the Igniting a Nation Broadcasting Network. You can find us on the web at IANBN.com or IgnitingAnation.com. Our program is televised live every day from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. In my opening re remarks, I talked about Islam. On our program today at 10 o'clock, we'll be talking with Colonel Robert Michael Hicks, the author of a book called Few Call It War, Religious Terrorism Then and Now. He has a very, very interesting approach to the historical foundation of religious terrorism. Our second guest today will be Jacob Domkani from Tel Aviv. Uh, well known for his street evangelism of promoting Jesus, Yeshua, as the promised Messiah. And has an interesting story himself of uh, persecution and what it's like to live as a Jewish believer in Israel. And our final guest of the day is Jerry Rasomni. He's written a book called From Jihad to Jesus, talking about his growing up in a Lebanese militant home and coming to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Few of us really understand Islam. So I thought I would take this time to explore it with you. I'm not one to study the counterfeit. I'm one to spend my time in the Bible. But the pressing issue of the growth of Islam growing at five times the rate faster than Christianity caused me to do a deep dive into a study on really exposing Islam, revealing what they believe, and quoting from the Quran so that we could see that although much propaganda is promoted of a religion or an ideology of peace, that the foundation in which they're built upon is more violent than we might even realize. As a believer in the Word of God and the Scriptures, the Holy Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we too see a great deal of violence. But we do not see violence for the purpose of converting people to a belief system. God used his hand to defeat the enemies of Israel. And most who read the Old Testament don't really understand why he destroyed or annihilated certain people groups. But understand that their agenda was anti-Jewish and had those nations been allowed to survive they would have annihilated the Jews and Jesus would never have been born. And since God's purpose was always to be in relationship with man and to provide a way of forgiveness and salvation, he had to clear the path so that we could survive all the way to Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago and to his promised return when Jerusalem cries out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So as we examine it, we find out that Islam is a religion of rigid monotheism and an all-encompassing law. It's a belief system, a world and life view. Everything in Islam is seen from an Islamic perspective. Islam's five fundamental articles of faith is number one, there is no God but God. Allah is the Arabic word for God. This God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. Everything that occurs is according to his will. He is also the source of both good and evil. The Quran assigns 99 names to Allah. The 100th name is secret and is known only to the camel. Number two, God gave prophets, the Quran mentions 28, to every age from Adam to Muhammad. Muhammad, the last and greatest prophet, was sinless as were all the other prophets. Jesus was the prophet of the previous age. They affirm that Jesus was born of a virgin and performed many miracles, but they vehemently deny that he was God, 
was crucified or rose from the dead. Number three, Islam believes that each age was given a book through its prophets, but all have been lost except portions of the Old Testament and the Gospel of Jesus which was corrupted by Christians. The Quran was given to Muhammad and supersedes all other revelations. The Quran is divided into 114 surahs or chapters and was given directly to Muhammad. To the Muslim, every word of the Quran is the word of God and is of eternal nature. In other words, it exists in heaven prior to being dictated by the angel Gabriel. The Quran governs every area of the life of a Muslim, from how to prevent crime to the proper use of a toothpick. It is, the, it is often the only constitution of some Muslim countries. Number four, there are good and bad angels. The chief good angel is Gabriel and the chief fallen angel is Shaitan or Satan. And the fifth tenet of their faith is there will be a day of judgment in which all the dead will be resurrected. Allah will be the judge and each person will be sent either to heaven to a place of sensual pleasure or hell a place of torment. Hell is for those who opposed Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Salvation is attained by the quality of a person's obedience to the law as determined by Allah. Muhammad is seen as a mediator who helps a person attain salvation. The bridge to paradise is likened to a razor sharp sword Muhammad awaits to assist in crossing. Each Muslim has six obligatory duties. Number one, reciting the, cre the creed, there is no God but Allah. The word Quran in Arabic means to recite. Number two, they must pray five times a day facing Mecca. Number three, tithe to the poor and for the furtherance of Islam, and it varies from two to 10%. Number four, they must fast for one month each year during the ninth month, the lunar month of Ramadan. This month of fasting is during the day only Feasting takes place after sundown. And they must make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once during a lifetime. A male who makes a pilgrimage to Mecca is called a Hajj, a title of honor similar to the English Sir. The concept of Jihad, holy war, is sometimes referred to as a six pillar. Jihad is also a religious duty of all adult males who must commit to any summons of war against infidels. Any who die in such a war are assured paradise. Today there is a controversy as to who in the Arab world can legally declare a jihad. In the past this has been a most successful form of evangelism. Polytheistic cultures have been given the option of submission or death. Historically Jews and Christians, since they were considered people of the book, were given a choice of submission or paying tribute or taxes. There are some other Muslim beliefs. The unforgivable sin to a Muslim is to attribute deity to anything other than God himself. To claim that Jesus or God is the Son of God is blasphemy to a Muslim. They believe that God is unbegotten and begets not, therefore denying that God had a son. Most Muslims believe Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad when he said he would send another comforter in John 14, 16. Muslims even refer to Muhammad as the Holy Spirit. Muslims are very anti-Trinitarian. The Quran teaches that Christians believe in a trinity of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and they say Mary the Mother, but of course we know that the doctrine of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. Most Muslims believe Judas died on the cross, not Jesus. God caused Jesus to be ascended into heaven. Most Muslims do not separate church and state, politics and religion. There's no such thing as secular and sacred. There is a cause of some of their intramural conflicts. This is the cause of some of them. And occasionally a ruler attempts to secularize the state for this Anwar Sadat was assassinated. Turkey gets away with it, but is resented in much of the Muslim world. The Quran allows a man to have up to four wives if he believes he can treat them equally. The Quran teaches that if a Muslim soldier kills another Muslim soldier in an unjust war, he will go to hell. 
In the recent war, many Iraqi soldiers did not believe it was just war, to, hence they deserted in large numbers and probably for other reasons as well. Muslim soldiers can declare a victory in battle even though they were stomped by the enemy because to a Muslim, win or lose, it is the will of Allah. And so if you lose, you win because it is the will of Allah. The Quran teaches that Muslims should take up arms against infidels. The following quote from the Quran should give insight into Muslims' behavior. When you encounter unbelievers, strike off their heads until you have made a great slaughter among them and bind them in bonds and either give them free remission afterwards or exact a ransom. Verily, if God please, he could take vengeance on them without your assistance, but he commands you to fight his battles. And to those who fight in defense of God's true religion, God will lead them into paradise. Many people ask the question, are Allah and God the same? Is the Allah of Islam and the God of the Bible the same? Well, according to the Quran, in Surah 265 and 66, Allah turned Sabbath-breaking Jews into apes. In Surah 451, Jews and Christians believe in idols and false deities. In Surah 559, Jews and Christians are evil livers. In Surah 551, don't take Jews or Christians for friends. If you do, Allah will consider you to be one of them. To those who say God and Allah are the same, by virtue of the aforementioned quotes from the Quran, does it make sense that Jews and Christians should worship a God who curses them? Another quote from the Quran which Christians should pay special attention to is no, no son did Allah beget from Surah 2391. Given this, one has to wonder why any Jew or Christian would suggest we all pray to the same God. Yet there is an ongoing effort being embraced by many Christians, Muslims, and some Jews in support of this view. The God of the Bible declared himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Islam teaches that Allah commanded Abraham to sacrifice Ishmael, not Isaac, and today they celebrate it as a holiday. Eid al adha is an Islamic festival to commemorate the willingness of Abraham, also known as Abraham, to follow Allah, God's command to sacrifice his son, Ishmael. Now we read from the Bible, the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3, 13 and 15. Eliminate the, Jew the Jewish people, and Jesus never comes in the line of David. Eliminate the Jewish people, and Jesus doesn't come back. From Matthew 23, 37 through 39. This enmity, it exists, is now those who do not serve God, but serve the seed of the serpent. We read in Genesis 16, 9, Then the angel of the Lord told her to go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now a child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Here we see that Ishmael will rise up, and that his brothers will war against him. We understand now the Sunnis and the Shiites, Muslims battling against each other's brothers. Ali was the first Imam, his son Hassan the second, his second son Hussein the third. Ali's sons were killed in the conflict with the Caliph Muay. However, their succession ended with the twelfth Imam who went into hiding in 940. Most Shiites believe that the twelfth Imam will reemerge someday as the Mahdi or Messiah and reassert his leadership of the Islamic world. 
In the meantime, Ayatollahs are elected to serve as caretakers of the faith. Most Sunnis and Shiites are liberal, although not by Western standards. In peaceful and prosperous times, there is little conflict between them. But both have more extreme factions as well. Some Shiites, for example, have a tradition of valuing martyrdom that came out of their early experiences of conflict with the Sunnis. The most famous Sunni extremist faction is the Wahhabi sect, of which Osama bin Laden was a member. It's characterized by radical fundamentalism. The Quran is not to be interpreted, but rather to be taken literally. There are to be no prayers or appeals to prophets, saints, or any entity other than God. There are to be no images of or monuments to any supposed Islamic leaders, not even elaborate tombs for famous Muslims. And the Quran is to be the sole source of secular as well as religious laws. We know that some translations of the Bible talk in Genesis that, as I quoted in my rant, that the prophecy was that uh, he would be a wild donkey among men and all the nations of the war would war against him and he would move his kingdom east. And how interesting is it that the countries with the highest percentage of Muslim population are to the east of Israel. Indonesia, Malaysia, India, all of the Arab Muslim countries bordering Israel to the east. And we see the advancement of Islam around the world. St statistically speaking, Islam is growing at five times faster rate than Christianity. The average Muslim home has six children. Four wives are allowed that could be 24 children in one family with one father. We know that the average American home or Christian home has 1.5 to two children. So that accounts for three times the amount in the advancement of Islam through websites, social media, magazines, information, the internet, and cultural advances by immigration have increased the population. When politically correct, tolerant, and culturally diverse societies agree to Muslim demands for their religious privileges, some of the other components tend to creep in as well. Here's how it works. As long as the Muslim population remains around or under 2% in any given country, they will be for the most part regarded as peace-loving minority and not as a threat to other citizens. That's the case in the United States, Australia, Canada, China, Italy, and Norway. At 2% to 5%, they begin to proselytize from other ethnic minorities and disaffected groups, often with major recruiting from the jails and among street gangs. We see this happening in Denmark, Germany, the UK, Spain, and Thailand. From 5% on, they exercise an inordinate influence in proportion to the percentage of the population. For example, they were pushed for the introduction of halal, meaning clean by Islamic standards for their food, thereby securing food preparation jobs for Muslims. They'll increase pressure on supermarket chains to feature halal on their shelves, along with threats for failure to comply. We know that Walmart, Costco, and many of the food stores in America now carry halal meat because of the advancing influence that Islam has here in America. In France, the Muslim po population exceeds 8%, and we saw the terrible, horrible impact of the terrorist attack in Paris. The Philippines, Sweden, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Trinidad, and Tobago all exceed 5%. At this point, they begin to move into ruling government parties to allow them to rule themselves within their ghettos under Sharia, the Islamic law. We saw this take place just recently when London elected their first Muslim mayor and England established their first Sharia court a separate judicial system under Islamic law for trials of 
offenses under the Quran and establishing Sharia law and no-go zones which are ruled, managed, and policed by Muslims themselves. The ultimate goal of the Islamist is to establish Sharia law over the entire world. When Muslims approach 10% of the population, they tend to increase lawlessness as a means of complaint about their conditions. In Paris, we already see car burnings. Any non-Muslim action offends Islam and results in uprising and threats, such as in Amsterdam with opposition to Muhammad cartoons and films about Islam. Such tensions are seen daily, particularly in Muslim sections in Guyana, India, Israel, Kenya, and Russia. After reaching 20%, nations can expect hair-triggered rioting, jihad militia formations, sporadic killings, and the burning of Christian churches and Jewish synagogues, such as in Ethiopia, which is now exceeding 33% Muslim population. These are statistical analysis done by sociologists who have followed this and tracked this and established these based on historical trends of what is happening. At 40% of the population, nations experience widespread massacres, chronic terror attacks, and ongoing militia warfare, such as Bosnia, Chad, and Lebanon, where Islam exceeds over 50% of the population. From 60% nations experience unfettered persecution of non-believers of all religions, including non-conforming Muslims. Sporadic ethnic cleansing, genocide, use of Sharia law as a weapon, and Jizra, the tax placed on infidels such as in Albania, Malaysia, Qatar, and Sudan. After 80% expect daily intimidation and violent jihad, some state-run ethnic cleansing, even some genocide, as these nations drive out the infidels and move towards 100% Muslim, such as ongoing in Egypt, where the Muslim population is 90%, Gaza at 98.7%, Indonesia at 86.1%, Iran 98%, Iraq 97%, Jordan 92%, Morocco 98.7%, Pakistan, 97%. Palestine, 99%. Syria, 90%. Turkey, 99.8%. The United Arab Emirates, 96%. 100% will usher in the peace called Dar es Salaam, the Islamic House of Peace. Here, there's supposed to be peace because everyone is a Muslim. The madrasas are the only schools and the Quran is the only word, such as in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, and Yemen, where the Muslim population is at 100%. Non-Muslim no-entry zones have been multiplying all over Europe and even popping up in cities here in the United States. This should heighten every American's awareness of the imminent danger we as a nation are facing. Once established, they are unsafe, Providing dead, proving deadly for non-Muslims to inhabit or even walk through the neighborhood. I'm not an Islamophobe. I have no fear of Islam. And I am not anti-Islam. And I want to make it very clear that I am not anti-anything. I am pro-God and pro-Jesus. And when an agenda and an ideology involves the taking of lives, beheadings and the forced conversions, it reminds me of the days when the Jews were persecuted in the same way, that we were forced to either convert or die. This is terrorism in the name of religion, a foundation. And if we look at what the controlling document of Islam, it is the Quran. And one out of every 55 verses, 50 or 55 verses of the Quran, deals with violence. Parts of the United Kingdom have already become no-go areas for police because minority communities are operating their own justice systems. This comes directly from the government, the chief inspector of the constabulary. Honor killings, domestic violence, sexual abuse of children, 
and female genital mutilations are just some of the offenses that are believed to go unreported in some cities and growing at an alarming rate. It starts off innocently enough with them wanting to share a neighborhood with like-minded, religious thinking community dwellers. They slowly go larger and incorporate more Muslims into the area and begin buying a property as fast as it becomes available or leasing it. Then they install their own courts, government, justice, and punishment systems, Sharia law. In the United States, in Dearborn, Michigan, over 100,000 Muslims, 45% of the city have settled into the first no-go zone. The city and police officials have been sued in many cases that allege discrimination against Christians effectively by the authorities applying Sharia law. Dearborn Dar, Dar al-Islam, a place governed by Islamic Sharia law. The new idea of no-go and no entry is significant and shockingly being upheld. They provide weapons and guards and government officials in their own societies. Their schools inside their kids are educated in. They're taught their religion in school. No separation of church, mosque, and state. The recent terrorist attack in France represents a deeper problem rising across both Western Europe and Russia. Coping with the growing no number of hidden jihadist cells who see this attack as the only, only the dawn of a new way of international terrorism. The migration out of Syria all across Europe has changed the demographics of Europe entirely. And the percentage of the Muslim population as we see in Germany with their open border system, as we see all across Europe of the tremendous impact it's had, the lawlessness, the number of sexual assaults, rape, child molestation, horrible crimes being committed but are permitted under the Koran. You cannot be a Bible believing Christian and not embrace the entirety of the teachings of Jesus or the commands of God. And so as we are measured as Christians, we're measured as Christians in obedience to God's word. So it is with other ideologies if they have such a document. In this case, it is the Quran for Islam. So whether someone is a secular Muslim or they are an active in their faith Muslim or they are what some call a radical Muslim, they all stand on the same commands, the same word of the Quran that they consider to be the inspired word of God passed by Gabriel to Muhammad. It allows for these kind of offenses. It allows for these kind of atrocities. It allows for the advancement of Sharia and to establish a worldwide caliphate. Biblically speaking, when we take a look at the one world order, when we take a look at the prophecy, the prophecy in the Garden of Eden, the oldest prophecy in the Bible of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and we know the seed of the woman is Jesus, we know the seed of the serpent is the Antichrist. He will be the one that will broker and sign a seven-year peace agreement, bringing peace to Israel. It is in my mind that the Antichrist must come out of Islam for only someone from within Islam could command two billion people who have sworn themselves to be enemies of Israel to cease to attack them. So if the Antichrist comes out of Islam, and we're beginning to see the power and the strength of the advancement of Sharia and the advancement of the Caliphate across the world, we begin to understand that the dividing line that God is talking about, that God spoke about through Daniel, spoke about in Revelation, spoke about through the prophets that the time is coming that we will be divided 
But there will be those that conform to the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, the number of his name. And for most people who don't understand what that means, it is the number of his name as in Hebrew. Every Hebrew letter has a value, a numeric value. There are 22 Hebrew letters. Each value is assigned to a letter. So the number of someone's name is taking and assigning the numeric value to each one of those letters in his name and adding those numbers up. And so we know that the name in Hebrew of the Antichrist will add up to the number 666. Now, many names already add up to the number 666. But yet, we don't identify them as the Antichrist yet. But when we see a leader rise up, one who we believe is able to broker peace in the Middle East, one who is willing to usher in the tribulation period by the signing of that seven-year treaty, we will see the rise of the Antichrist and the dividing line of humanity. Are we not already getting a glimpse of that? Is the world not being divided into two camps? Are we not seeing that almost two billion, two billion, a large number, a great percentage of the population of the world are now Muslims. Muslims required to adhere to the teachings of Muhammad and the Quran. As it exceeds and begins to exceed and grow past Christianity to become the dominant ideology of the world, they will exponentially grow in strength and power and will begin to form that coalition to take over governments as they've done throughout the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and a vast portion of Asia. We're seeing it happen, but we don't believe it will happen here. Most are unaware at the size and the magnitude of even one terrorist organization called ISIS. Over 50,000 strong. Their name itself tells you all about them. Their name is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They want to establish a state government controlled by Islam, controlled by this particular Sunni organization which represent over 80 percent of the Muslim population of the world are Sunnis. They have become the most violent branch. And we look at Iraq, uh, at Iran and Pakistan and know that the day of violence will rise up from the Shiites, but yet today it is the Sunnis that are warring around the world. The world is being divided along ideological lines by refusing to acknowledge it as our current president has done for eight years and refusing to call it Islamic terrorism. Believing that if he gives credence to it that it will increase it. Its very denial of it has fueled the flames. The regulations he passed of not allowing us to vet Syrian refugees by checking their social media is the very cause of the San Bernardino slaughter because the social, uh, social media check of the Facebook posting of the wife of the man who shot all those people in San Bernardino revealed that she was a radical Islamic terrorist. Our government's hands are stained with the blood of those victims. In further denial of calling it terrorism, religious terrorism, Islamic terrorism, 
will catch you completely unaware. It is advancing at an alarming rate. God has told us that this day is coming when there will be a new world order. And we as believers must stand firm in our faith. It is believed that 50% who proclaim themselves as Christians today will accept the mark of the beast. And so I challenge you, each and one of you, every one of you to examine your heart, your faith, to see is it strong enough to withstand the kind of persecution that will come when your family is threatened with death if you do not accept that mark. We're seeing it unfold throughout the world. It just hasn't happened here yet. But be aware, be prepared, keep your eyes open for it's just around the corner. You're watching Revealing the Truth right here on the United Nations Broadcasting Network. We'll be right back.